that was on the other main bus. And uh, this uh, induced an under voltage on the other main bus. And uh, that's when I uh, got a little smarter and uh, thought uh, maybe I'd look at the other fuel cells, which I hadn't even uh, considered as having had a problem. And I found uh, fuel cell one also uh, not outputting any amps. Uh, from this uh, from this point on, there, we were kind of under the uh, under the hands of uh, Houston and uh, further troubleshooting and uh, uh, looking at a few more dials down on a, another meter and the LEB to look at the regulated pressures and uh, and eventually we got to the point where uh, Houston uh, called up and asked us to shut down uh, fuel cell three, shut down. Uh, uh, the reactance valve, and I uh, asked for a reconfirmation since uh, when you do that, it's sort of irreversible. If you shut one of these things down, they uh, uh, only can be restarted from uh, ground support equipment. And uh, they uh, assured me they really meant it, so I went through with it, and uh, subsequently the uh, same command was given for fuel cell one. Uh, about this point in time, the uh, cryo pressure, the oxygen pressure had uh, gone in uh, cryo tank two, and the pressure in tank number one was uh, rather steadily, slowly, but steadily decreasing. It was obvious it wasn't holding its own. And uh, right about then, it, uh, it was quite apparent to me that there was just a question of time that the command module was going to be dead, uh, that we were going to lose that fuel cell also. So I kind of lost interest in that position and headed for the limb. I, I think one other thing that's, uh, that we neglected to mention, that uh, I abandoned my efforts to put in the hatch when Jim noticed uh, we had considerable venting out the side uh, of the command module. So they indicated we were losing some sort of uh, uh, liquid or material from the area of the service module. So it indicated to us that we truly had a problem in the service module. I guess it's kind of interesting to, uh, to know what the feelings are on a crew when something like this happens. When you first hear this explosion or bang, you don't know what it is. And we've had similar sounds in the spacecraft before that were for nothing. And then, uh, to me, my impression was, as we came back, that, uh, that we had an electrical problem that caused this bang, because we, in previous testing, we had uh, some problems along these lines. Uh, that quickly went away. And I looked out the window and saw this venting. And my, my concern was increasing all the time. It went from, I wonder what this is going to do to the landing, to I wonder if we can get back home again. And it uh, sort of went into that type of seriousness. And when I looked up and saw both uh, oxygen pressures, one absolutely zero and the other one going down, uh, it, it dawned on me, and I'm sure Jack and Fred about the same time, that we were indeed in serious trouble. It was apparent, and the ground told us so, and they were right on the, on the ball all the time, that the only way to survive the situation was to transfer to the LEM. And so uh, at that time, Fred, first of all, went into the LEM, got out our activation checklist, a checklist which normally is not used until prior to powering up the LEM to detached from the command module and prepared to go down to the lunar surface. And we started going through procedures to get LEM power on and to align the platform. The first milestone, and I consider this after the accident, I guess, more or less the survival now, the first milestone was to get alignment on the LEM platform. Alignments are important, you know, because uh, without knowing exactly which way the attitude of a spacecraft is in space, there's no way to tell how to burn or how to use the engines of that spacecraft to get the, pro the proper trajectory to come home. So we had to have an alignment on board the spacecraft. We knew that the command module was going to lose it pretty soon because we we're going to lose power. So as we worked, Fred and I went into the lunar module. Fred got the power on. We started to align the platform. We used a procedure that was in the activation checklist. Jack gave us the angles. Uh, there was a little bit of arithmetic involved in all these uh, procedures, and 
And I had an occasion during practice to fail my arithmetic test, and I was so concerned about being sure that this arithmetic was correct that I had actually called down to the ground, let them do the math, came back in and put it in. But we did get a platform alignment, and that was our first milestone. From then on, it was an entirely different situation, and this little model might tell you exactly how, how we were. Up until the incident, the normal command is in the command module. Uh, control is by the service module engines, as RCS engines, as far as attitude control goes. But we transferred our command to the lunar module, and we are using the lunar module engines for control. We had done some practice in this before, but uh, really had never thought that we'd ever have to use this particular control situation. And to get control of this vehicle, uh, in pitch, you have to use one translation controller uh, in, in one way, and in roll another way, and in yaw you can use the ACA. So what we did, uh, Fred would handle one part of the control, and I would handle the other in controlling the maneuverability of the spacecraft. We also had back here a service module that was completely filled with uh, main engine fuel. We had used very little of it, just in one small mid-course burn. And also, we had RCS engines that were almost completely filled with fuel. An important point to remember at this time, too, was the fact that we had gotten off what we call the free return trajectory. We had done our mid-course maneuver sometime before, and this meant that we were no longer on a path that would allow us to be swung around the moon and come back towards the landing spot on the Earth. We had gotten off this trajectory because we wanted to uh, go to our landing site. So the first thing the ground told us to do was to burn the dips engine, the descent propulsion engine, uh, to get us back on that free return trajectory, which, if I remember correctly, was going to get us into, what, the Indian Ocean, wasn't it? Yes. I think I lost track of oceans after a <laughs> while. Ago. Yes, it was an Indian Ocean at about 155 hours. About 155 hours. The uh, controllability of the spacecraft uh, was okay as long as we had our, our indicators up because we had practiced that, as I had said. But suddenly, to save power, we shut that down for a while, and we had it controlled by only looking at our computer display. And I had never tried that before. I really don't know who had, and it's a very difficult task. And we spent a lot of our first part of our emergency or survival time just learning how to control the spacecraft in this mode. Our second milestone was what was known as the Parasynthium plus two burn. Our first maneuver was to get us back on free return. The second one was to get us home early. The nominal flight time back home was 155 hours if we had done nothing else. But because consumables were critical and the ground was calculating consumables and Fred was also doing the back of envelope type calculation which he figured if we were lucky, we had about one hour spare uh, consumables left before we had landed. We had decided, uh, or the ground had decided to burn at, uh, at about two hours past the moon, at about 79 hours, a maneuver to shorten the time to get home again. This was also going to be an automatic burn using the descent propulsion engine. And uh, this burn was also very successful. After that, the ground was very much concerned with power, and we were too. And we decided to go into a power down mode. We, we turned off just about everything, and I'd like to have Jack and Fred tell about our power down situation and some of our survival and environmental problems. Fred, go ahead. With that. Well, on the limb side of the house, uh, we uh, actually had already canned a pretty good procedure in a book called the uh, Contingency Checklist, which is, was pretty appropriate. And uh, I guess, uh, well, first of all, to back up to the consumable business, uh, the one-hour reserve I computed was on uh, water 